presentation is titled Electron Express. Um, it, for reasons you'll see why in, in just a moment. Um, I'm taking us from the absolute rock bottom beginning um, and then going through Node, JS, Electron, Express, and other applications. Um, and the, the intent here, I, I have a couple of things. First of all, I, I want to try to make this as clear to people who don't do development as possible. And uh, it's, you know, it's uh, for those of you who do do development, there's probably going to be quite a bit of review. Um, but I just want to move everybody at the same page. I'm going to move fairly briskly through this material. Um, but I do have hooks and links and things. If you have a question, do feel free to stop me and I can show you code. Everything I'm showing you here, I have working examples of on this computer, so I can show you anything at all. So, um, from the very beginning, um, I even, even have the things you need to install to make all of this work. So the first thing to install is Node. It's a simple install. It installs anywhere. Um, Node is basically a JavaScript environment that can run on a web server. Um, as you'll see, it can serve web pages uh, and basically replace your ordinary web server. And it's really useful to have it on your computer because you have a web server on your computer if you have this. Another big thing to install, if you haven't installed it, is Git. Uh, horrible, messy, complex piece of software that in itself takes quite a bit of getting used to. Um, but uh, basically I've got it down to one command uh, for this presentation, which is git clone. Um, and that's what this is really useful for. Um, but you... But Git's a repository. You, GitHub is a repository. Uh, GitLab is a repository. Okay. Git is the software that allows you to work with these repositories. See the distinction? Yes. Yeah. It's a client. It yeah. Basically, it's a client. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing, and this is the piece that really allowed everything to come together for me. Is, is Visual Studio Code. Um, now I've been using text editors for like ever, mm -hmm. right? Um, Visual Studio Code, is, it's actually a Microsoft product, if you can believe it. Um, and it brings in into a single environment all the tools that I needed in order to become really, really productive in this environment. So what does it do? <clears throat> So here's some core concepts. You already know these concepts. This is like I say, I'm starting from the very beginning. One core concept is files and folders, right? You're going to be working with files and folders a lot. One of the lessons that I learned, if you start a new project, start with a nice clean folder. I know it seems obvious, but to me it wasn't. Um, but so you, that's one of the key things that you need. Another thing, text editor, like I say. Uh, text editor is nothing fancier than Notepad. Uh, you can get text editors with a lot of bells and whistles, but ultimately what you want is something that edits text. And then the third thing is the command shell. Now, this is always a bit tricky. Um, on Linux, there's no problem. The command shell is basically Linux. On Windows, it's annoying. There's a Windows command shell, and then there's Windows PowerShell, which is mostly what I use. Uh, but even so, Windows doesn't give you everything. Um, in an ideal world, you'd run uh, Linux for Windows, um, but we can't run it here because it requires access to the Windows Store, which we're not allowed to access, apparently. Um, Nonetheless, I've managed to make things work with PowerShell. Things work pretty well, but I did require that kind of environment to make it all work. All right, so take those three core concepts and put them together. On the left, you have your file structure. On the upper right, you have your text editor. On the lower right, you have your command shell. And that is Visual Studio Code. 
on the left the file structure in the upper right the text editor on the lower right the uh, command shell wow okay love it i love this all right uh, it's it's uh and it's free and it's free and the kicker is it runs on electron it is an electron application the thing that i'm talking about actually makes that possible so huh. yeah yeah <laughs> okay now another peculiarity with windows is the path um sometimes things work sometimes they don't uh, so here i am i'm in powershell i could also do this in visual studio code um i test the things that i installed earlier node so i'm in the command line i just type to node hyphen v right node space hyphen v and it comes up with the version number similarly with npm i'll talk about that a bit later that comes with node but you need to test it too just in case and then git again um uh, trying it from the command line git space version of course there's no you know uh, consistent syntax for even finding out what version the software is but there you go but they're, they're, they're really good uh, git clients uh, there, there are really good git clients I agree but what I've found through my experience is in this environment there are distractions right. so and as well um, and I, I don't cover this in this presentation. The Visual Studio Code is a fully functioning Git client. Right. So you don't need it. But I don't cover that aspect of that in this presentation. But it's there if you need it. So um, I never thought I'd be enthusiastically endorsing <laughs> Microsoft. But I'm enthusiastically endorsing Microsoft. They have done something really good here. Um, so anyhow. Um, what might happen when you run these tests is Windows says, I can't find these because sometimes the installation doesn't go as planned. If it can't find the thing, even though you've installed it, it's because it's not in the path. The path is configuration that tells where, Windows where to look mm -hmm. to find the program. And so uh, I've got a link there and instructions uh, basically, if it's not working, it has to be added to the path. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're inserting into the path variable the directory where that program is located, whether it's Git or Node or whatever. Just as an aside with respect to this presentation, for every single slide, pretty much, I think every single slide, there's a link at the bottom and that link at the bottom is very often a full day, two days, five days worth of stuff you need to learn. Um, so that's why, you know, this isn't a how-to presentation. This is a survey presentation. But those links do take you to the how-to all of this stuff because it's complex. Okay, that's the preliminaries. JavaScript. What makes JavaScript brilliant in my mind, uh, and it really is brilliant, I've, I've worked with it for many years and so have other people here, um, is that it basically has direct access to the document object model or the DOM. And one of the core concepts of JavaScript is the use of selectors to access elements of the document object model. So you can use JavaScript, use a selector in JavaScript to refer to a paragraph content, a form element, a list item, etc. And then there's also an analogous set of selectors for the browser object model. So you can find features about the browser, what version it is, the size, etc. Another thing about JavaScript is the way it uses events. Uh, JavaScript uses listeners um, to respond to events on web pages. There's a whole list of them. There's the reference, for example. Um, I've got in the picture the on click event, right? So if you click, um, then there's a function that says on click and do such and such. And that function just sits there and waits for a click. When you click, it'll do something. 
uh, a lot of the uh, interoperability with your browser comes from that. Um, uh, hover, uh, if you hover your mouse, if you do a left swipe, whatever, uh, it can pick up these events and then run a function. Another major feature of JavaScript is JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. Uh, this is XML for real people. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but really, um, JSON is a way of representing data in JavaScript such that it is directly accessible to JavaScript. JavaScript just thinks of it as a part of the document object model, if you will. It's essentially an extension of that. I'm hand waving a bit there, but uh, what you're looking at on the screen there is the complete set of rules for formatting content in JSON. It looks a little complex, but it's not that complex, and really it resolves to something very simple. So it's very easy to work with. The nice thing about JSON is you give JavaScript some JSON data. It doesn't have to do any parsing, reformatting, any crap at all. It's directly accessible to JavaScript. For that reason, I love JSON. Uh, I see JSON as the long-term replacement of XML, personally. Here's a, a side by side comparison. Uh, you know, in many ways they do the same thing. JSON has a bit more flexibility in that it can do both hash, hashes and lists. XML, I suppose, can do that, but it gets complicated. Uh, JSON also has the advantage, to my mind, of being easier for humans to read. Uh, the, but they're both machine readable, but JSON, in the case of JavaScript, is directly machine readable. If you're using Python or Perl or something else, you'll end up parsing JSON into a data structure that's native to that language. Finally, the <clears throat> yeah, I, just, uh, just a note, I don't think that, you know, maybe it, it's, it's definitely more readable and more yeah. easy to use, but there are... Uh, clear limitation in JSON for searching uh, definitely the, the, not structured the data in XML a lot more powerful in tools. XML there are there are definitely <laughs> yeah there's uh, there are query tools specific yeah. to XML and that's one of the advantages of XML um, I just like JSON because I never yeah, search <laughs> no I'm just kidding <laughs> um, the the fourth thing uh, and, and, and last thing with JavaScript is something called AJAX or Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, basically, it allows uh, JavaScript functions to communicate with other web servers and send data back and forth. Uh, so we have a representation there, an event happens in the browser, uh, the browser sends a request, the server receives the request, sends back some data, probably in JSON, um, and that's the basis for a lot of, well, a lot of pr pretty much all of the interactivity that happens on the web. Um, so AJAX is used for browser server interaction? Yes. So it used to be something else? Uh, it used to be, well, back in the day it was CGI. CGI, that's yeah. it. Okay, and uh, so this, so we use yeah. this instead of CGI. Yeah, and CGI is common gateway interface, yeah. right? Um, so AJAX, um, it, it works using many of the same protocols as CGI, like it'll use get and put and post, etc. Mm -hmm. um, okay. the, the big difference between a, a JavaScript request and a CGI request from the perspective of the browser is that with a CGI request, you're typically reloading the entire page. There are exceptions to that, but typically that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. With AJAX, you have the same web page. It doesn't go anywhere. It's just the web page itself is talking with the server and then updating itself. Mm -hmm. So you're not reloading the page. Mm -hmm. So you can see that makes for data transfers being yeah. much more efficient. Yeah. All right, so just a quick little example that I played with uh, to illustrate some of the capacity. Uh, this is uh, JavaScript being used to access a service um, from Microsoft. In fact, it's in a Microsoft Azure service. And uh, where's my mouse? <laughs> oh, right, okay. It's going to be tricky on me. 
there we go come back <laughs> um, so yeah if I just pop into it here uh, oh you silly thing okay I see what's happening because nothing's ever easy so here it is right so this is just a simple uh, web page as you can see it uses JavaScript not very much JavaScript uh, which is what I, one of the things I love about this and um, this is a live thing this is a real key um, so I got a, an image from Wikimedia here and there's the image and what it's done is it's contacted the uh, um, the uh, Azure, or, yeah it's contacted Azure but a specific thing I forget what they call it like image, image recognition image, uh, uh, vision something vision hmm. um, it's actually on there but anyhow um, computer vision duh uh, mine like a steel trap <laughs> um, but basically it's creating that caption or that alt text for the image mm -hmm. by analyzing the image and generating the text wow. this, this is the norm for what's happening in the future right um, where you know stuff like this is going to be part of everyday applications um, so I look at this, you know, like for Grasshopper, I upload posts, I have little images, just a little JavaScript call uh, to Azure will automatically generate my alt text for my images. I kind of like that. I like that a lot. Powerful. Yeah. Uh, this is... All right. Um... So, um, now, in JavaScript, one of the things with JavaScript is there is a whole range of applications, frameworks, interfaces, etc. One of the earlier ones that I learned, one of the earlier ones to come out is something called jQuery. Um, jQuery is a library that essentially makes the selectors easier to use in JavaScript. One of the problems with JavaScript is the selectors are like this long. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but uh, in, I wonder what screen this is showing. <laughs> Never mind. Um, but, uh, oh, I see. but uh, so jQuery, as you can see in the example there, right? You know, my element equals get object by ID, etc. With uh, jQuery, you can just you know, use the dollar sign and ID the specific name of the element that you're referring to. And then it appends these functions. Um, this is pretty, this is a nice way of working, although it takes a bit of getting used to. Um, because JavaScript and therefore jQuery are object oriented, it treats all of these parts of the document object model as objects. And because they're objects, you can attach a function to them. And that's what's happening here, right? So you have this part of the, your document yeah. referred to by the name ID. Um, and then you apply the function remove to it. Yeah. And the, in this case, the object removes itself and disappears from view. Um, or you can have... Uh, you know, you, you can set the URL of that and it'll grab content from it. And you can set the value of it. There's all kinds of things you can do. Um, you can move it across the screen. Uh, you can show it and hide it, etc. You can alter its uh, visual properties such as CSS. A lot of these functions are handled, are created and handled by another library called Bootstrap. It comes out of Twitter and you can see the look and feel there. Uh, Bootstrap is basically uh, a bunch of standardized interface elements or UI elements, if you will. Hey, we actually are doing HCI here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so standardized buttons and things like that. 
again, takes a bit of getting used to, but once you're used to using it, it becomes very easy to create a standard interface uh, using jQuery and Bootstrap. It, very easy and, and very fast. So the buttons are objects, not just images. The buttons are objects, yeah. And, and they're objects, and JavaScript is listening for events that happen to them. It can do things with them. It can change their color, remove them from the screen, gray right. them out. Because they have all those properties. Because they have all those properties. The so um, all of... The, the new version of Grasshopper that I created, which I think you've probably seen, is built using jQuery and Bootstrap. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the advantages of using these frameworks is something called ARIA, or the Accessible Rich Internet Applications Standard. ARIA is what these uh, web services, websites use in order to be accessible. Uh, in addition to your regular uh, interface elements like buttons and, and, and uh, menus and things like that, there are uh, basically accessible widgets, forms, regions, etc. that can be used by assistive technology to allow somebody to manipulate the web page. So what happens is you build, say, um, a page with a bunch of tabs at the top uh, if you do it in Bootstrap, Bootstrap declares those using Araya. So it looks like an ordinary web page with tabs, but those tabs can be used and manipulated by assistive technology. Love it. Um, so part of Grasshopper is Araya compliant. Part of it isn't because all of this has been a learning experience for me over the last few years. Now, these frameworks get complex. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but here are the big three, Angular, React, and Vue. Um, each of those is a fairly significant effort to learn. Uh, they each have their advantages and their disadvantages. Uh, React, I'm not really a fan of because it's from Facebook. Um, that leaves you Angular or Vue. Um, anyhow, uh, I've linked to a couple of sites comparing the three. Basically, what these do is automate the process of a web page communicating with the back end. Um, that's, you know, that's uh, covering in one quick hand wave several days worth of presentation. So, and you need that on top of Ajax? So, um, yeah, Ajax is a concept that is a part of JavaScript. So it's, it's inherent to JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, these libraries use Ajax. They use Ajax type functions mm -hmm. in order to interact with the server. So basically they're taking advantage of that capacity in JavaScript. So it's kind of like a library. Kind of like a library, yeah, it's very similar. So, and the sort of thing like, uh, you know, like if you're on your Facebook page, say, and you have something like, uh, something that says, you know, someone who likes for a thing. The thing that updates that little display that says someone he likes, that's React, right? Mm -hmm. It's, if you will, reacting to changes of state that are happening in the back end while you're sitting there watching the front end. Mm -hmm. So there's a fair amount of interaction that goes back and forth, mm -hmm. and, and this automates all of that. Okay, that's the preliminaries. Let's get to Node. Um, Node, remember, is the thing that we installed at the beginning of all of this. Node is a way of running JavaScript on the server. JavaScript, oh. up until Node, was included in your web browser. It was part of your web browser, right? But Node lets you run JavaScript on its own on a web server. Brilliant idea. <laughs> um, and so basically, uh, you create a script file, for example, app.js. You run the script using the command line. And then it actually, in this case, it's actually a web server. And so you can view the output of this in your browser. Um, and we can 
we can actually do that here now because I'm running on two windows I'm not sure how this is going to work oh don't be so silly computer okay so I'm opening up here uh, Visual Studio Code and here it is on the screen Visual Studio Code and what I'm going to do is run this application app.js and all I do is I type node.js and then hit enter, enter oops, sorry node space app.js right see node runs as a command line application mm -hmm. so you see how handy this is right here's my script I can edit this whenever I want here I am running it okay so looks like nothing happened that's because if I want to actually see yes, output see. here, I need a command in here, something like console log listening on port 8080. But, so let me move that back over here. Um, and so the people who are watching it on the video can see it. Now I'm going to launch my web browser. And it actually is already looking for 8080. So there it is. Hello world we can see it in the browser. That's the essence of Node. That's what Node does. Um, so, let me, let me, I know. <laughs> now, let's bring this down. All right. So, brilliant concept. I just love this concept. So, here's how Node works. And, and this is kind of interesting. This isn't, I, this is the sort of thing that happens on the browser as well, but Node does this on the back end. So when you when you have a computer program, you have a stack of commands that the program's going to run for, run through, right? It's um, so it'll Node or JavaScript generally will run the first command, then the next, then the next, then the next, and it'll run those commands until the end. But a lot of web commands are things that take time, like a call to a database or a call to an external website using Ajax. And you don't want your whole browser to freeze while you're waiting for this to happen. That's what used to happen to web browsers. Uh, but now, what happens is these are put off to one side. Um, so you call the external function, then you put it off to one side, there's an actual name for it, which isn't on my slide, so I've forgotten what it's called. Um, but basically, that part of the script sits there and waits for a response. Meanwhile, the script keeps executing. So it's kind of neat. The last line in the script could actually run before the uh, an earlier line has gotten its content back. So it just sits there, it waits. When it gets a response, whether it's a successful response or an error or whatever, that response plus any functions attached to that response get put in the queue. Mm -hmm. And then it at the runs end, at, the end. at the end. So once it's run through everything in the stack, then it runs the first thing in the queue. Basically what it does is it takes the first callback in the queue, that goes into the stack and it'll run that. And then it'll take the next one and the next one and the next one and so on. Lovely, just lovely. It's like it's single threaded, but you get multi threaded kind of performance out of it. Mm -hmm. So I like that a lot. Um, okay, the, the other thing Node can do is read and write files on the local machine. This is what makes it a web server, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this is a simple little example. Uh, I don't even need to launch it, but again, um, I run the application just like I did before and when I access it with localhost 8080 it's viewing the web page and what's happening here in the code is um, it's reading the file and then and that's one of the things that will be put off to one side right and then it's sending out a response um, uh, write a header, or RES, respond by writing a header, respond by writing the data, and then finish your response. 
So you kind of have to be careful how you code this, right? Because you don't want it writing its response before it's received the data from the file. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times in JavaScript, you'll get do this and then next do this and next do this. And there's an infrastructure called promises that handles a lot of the sequential operation. A bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but it's there. It deals with timeouts. Deals with timeouts and things yeah. like that, exactly. Um, so, node.js has a bunch of built-in modules. Uh, some of these modules are for web requests, some of these modules are for listeners, etc. And I'll just pop in here. Um, W3Schools has a bunch of them. Um, put this, whoops, stop that. So there they are on the screen. So like the emailer, a little feed parser, because uh, you can access feeds from the web, right? It can act as a file server. HTTP is just a module that makes it a web server. Um, reading file, upload file, even silly things like uppercase, etc. All of these are modules. You can call them, and basically the way you call them, I think this might be another slide, but um, you know, feed parser, for example, um, you declare it as a constant or as a variable at the top, that makes it an object, and now that it's an object, you can uh, uh, use that object to run various functions. So, and, and that's the way to think of JavaScript. Um, an object is a collection of data JSON maybe or document object model whatever that against which you can run functions so for example suppose you want to access the content from another website you create an object you give it values like the URL of that other website and the type of request you want to send then you run a function get that uh, it does that and then the content now becomes new parts of that object that you created and then you can access them just like you access other parts of the object. All right, so. Um, so they reinvented Lisp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in a way that works. I was going to make a comment about Lisp when you talked about yeah. XML, but I thought, no, no, I shouldn't bring that up. <laughs> okay. And there are similarities, absolutely. Um, but. This is basic, I mean, it's built in your browser. <laughs> Anyhow, um, now NPM stands for Node Package Manager, or a whole bunch of other things if you go to the Node website, but it's Node Package Manager. And what this does is it installs additional modules for Node. Uh, I just showed you a bunch of them. There's a whole bunch more nodules, uh, modules. Uh, that shows a few of them. I won't talk about what they all are, but those are a few things that are installed um, using NPM. Most of what we're doing now is going to, uh, for the rest of this presentation, is going to use NPM. An alternative to NPM is something called YARN. Um, it basically does the same thing NPM does, um, but in slightly different ways. Ways that are arguably faster, more secure, etc. Um, so, um, basically what NPM does is it uses a file called package.json. So, the first thing you do is you run a command npm init. And that creates the file package.json. And here's, you can see package.json on the screen there in front of you. Um, this is a very simple one. But what package.json will do, there's two major things it'll do. There's a bunch of things, but two major things. First of all, it'll declare all the dependencies. That is to say, it'll list all of the modules that you are using in this program. And second, um, it'll define a number of scripts that you can use to run this program. 
uh, because you don't necessarily want to run it the same way each time. You might want to run it in development mode, for example, or you might want to run it in production mode. So you, you create different scripts for different ways of running this program. It's got other information like metadata about the program. But what's really neat about a package.json file is that NPM can use a package.json file to install all of these modules for you. So when you're developing, you might install a module. You might go npm install electron, say, or npm install express. npm will install that, but it'll put a notation into package.json. When you send this program to someone else, all you do is send them the package.json, and then they run npm install npm will look at package.json and install all the dependencies that you originally used mm -hmm. so you don't send yeah, them just, the whole program just a warning i'm the tank keeper here mm -hmm. we're five minutes over the hour yeah but um do you think you would need another 30 minutes to uh, present hopefully or? not uh, i'm not that's something uh, electron is the is uh, the the whole set of all those tools together? Kind of, but there's more. Okay. Trust me. You'll love this. This is worth the wait. I've gotten us to the point where it makes sense to talk about Electron. Yeah, it actually says Electron on the screen. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're getting closer. So here's the install that I just described, right? Um, so it when you're running npm you can install it directly when somebody else is running using your package.json file it will automatically install all the things so you don't need to keep track of it npm keeps track of it for you uh, and then when you go to use these modules in a node.js program uh, like i said earlier you declare them as constants of some sort so curl which is uh, a script that gets content from uh, websites or js dom or whatever right i uh, declare them at the top as objects and then you use those objects and run functions on those objects this is an example here and again i have working code for everything uh, it uses jquery scrapes the internet movie database for James Bond films and then lists them in order with the year that they came out. It's a simple thing, but it, it took a bit of messing around to make it work, but it does work. Um, when you're working in NPM, it's useful to have uh, Windows build tools also installed. So this is a slide I inserted here. It's one of the last slides I, I actually put in here. Save yourself lots of heartache. Run this right near the beginning when you begin to use NPM. Uh, it'll install things like some uh, scripts require Python in the back end and things like that. And this will include that for you. It'll download, install it, and include it for you. Very annoying. So, Yarn, I mentioned earlier, is an alternative to NPM. Uh, Yarn is used for one of the examples that follows as well. And again, links, etc. So, Express is a framework that runs in Node.js, and it's launched and used like any other module. Now, what Express does is it creates what are called routes or routes, whatever you want to call them. I'm in Ottawa, so I have to say routes. Um, there are other frameworks that do basically the same sort of thing. So, uh, like I say, it's a quick and easy installation. Um, what Express does is it creates these routes and gives you middleware that can handle uh, function. Now, what a route is, is if you access a web server, um, you, you access it with a particular protocol like get or put or post. So that's part of the route. And then um, you, you see, you go to a website and then it says slash people or slash page or whatever. That's the other part of the route. So you have get page or 
post user. Um, so that what Express does is it'll take those depending on the routes it'll run different functions. So if you have post user it'll look for post data in order to create a user or update a user. So the other thing it does is the middleware can take the content of the request that comes in and add other information to it or manipulate it in some way. For example, it can uh, apply rules related to cross-origin resource sharing. It can handle authentication, stuff like that. So it automates an awful lot of the painful things about running, uh, say, a content management system. So here's more with the roots, as I said. So you have the application itself, you have the router, then you have a specific root, and then it runs a function against that root. Again, a lot of hand waving over something that's fairly complex, but it's actually easy, relatively easy to run and make one of these websites work. So the, uh, the response object that comes back, not just from, um, uh, Express, but any node uh, web service uh, is, well, the res dot and then the different uh, function that's applied to that response object. Uh, you can send a response, there can be a response object specifically for JSON content, etc. Um, a lot of what happens in Express because of uh, these hooks is that you take the response and format the response before it goes back. And Pug is an example of a template engine uh, that's used by Express to format content from plain text basically into HTML. Um, now, because simply installing and building your site is too hard to contemplate, there are generators for Express. One of them is called Express Generator. And basically, uh, you install it and then you start it and it builds this entire content management system for you with various roots and hooks. Um, and so basically in about yeah, maybe 10 minutes, you have the, the bare bones web application ready to go. So, um, another thing Express can do uh, as well, well, Node can do this as well, is work in the back end with databases. Um, the database needs to be installed. Uh, I didn't put that in the installs at the beginning, but to make this stuff work with MySQL, I had to install MySQL on this computer. There's also, there are also um, JavaScript native, native uh, databases, um, uh, like NeSQL is one, um, SQLite is not really JavaScript native, but is a very popular uh, application because it can be bundled right with the node application. Feathers is another generator for um, for Express. Feathers is even easier to use um, and then Feathers does a lot of things involving hooks with the uh, contents of the different routes. Um, Here's, for example, a Feathers chat application. Uh, one of the things that, um, it's NeDB, not NeSQL. Uh, one of the things that uh, Feathers can do is instead of using HTTP, it can use WebSockets, and it would use WebSockets for a live interactive web application. That's a working chat engine. I won't open it up just for time purposes. It took a little bit of fiddling to make it work, but not a lot of fiddling. And then the second time I created one, it took me, well, it was, it was literally 10 minutes to get it up and running. Now, that brings us to, finally, Electron. Um, Electron, now take everything that we've talked about so far, put that into what the box here that we call main, 
right? With the uh, Node.js, menus, dialogs, browser window, etc. And then create another box, which is basically a Chromium browser. And that's what Electron is. It gives you two processes. It gives you the back end with Node.js and then a browser to display the results. And it bundles it all into a single package. And then it communicates through something called IPC or intra-process communication. A little bit technical, but not too hard to work with ultimately. That's what it is. Uh, I, well, it's brilliant, right? So um, and then what Electron does is it does all of that and then through a packaging process using something called Electron Packager, again, just another NPM module you install in the usual way, you run that with some variables like the platform and the architecture that you're looking at, um, and it creates a standalone application out of your node scripts. Now, this I think is pretty brilliant. Um, the neat thing about Electron is that it has all of the functionality of a website because it's running in a browser, but it also has access to, because it is running on Node.js on your machine, it has access to uh, your file system, your computer's processes, input, output, screen, whatever. Um, and so this demo here and I do want to run this. I know, I know there's time considerations, but you do want to see this. Um, so, by the way, if, if some people need to leave because of time constraints, uh, please do so. I mean, uh, we're over time now for now. Uh, so, TM. So, I'm just doing what's right on the screen there. I typed npm start. And it'll take a couple of seconds. So there's. So now it's running the script, and it has opened. I have to find it because it's here somewhere. There's my um, API demos. It's opened as an application, and here it is. Uh, as an application, this is a freestanding application written in Node. So here's the application written in Node. You can see this on, on, on the display screen here. And here's the application itself. And so I can create and manage Windows. So, oops, it's going to open on the other side here. There it is. Um, uh, I can register keyboard shortcuts. I can open external links. One of the things, is, so just popped open that. Uh, it it opened this in a browser. It can also open this um, in its own little window. Uh, it doesn't have to open it up in a browser. It can use system dialogues, error dialogues, etc. Open the file, put your app in the tray. I love this, right? Uh, so, oh, we're not going to see it on the screen, but on my computer, this app is now in the tray. Um, and I'll click it again. Now it's out of the tray. The one thing that doesn't work properly is notifications. I ran into tons of problems with notifications. Do you guys have a meeting? Okay, thanks. Sorry, I did the same thing that they did to us. <laughs> uh, anyhow, so um, this is a set of really powerful tools. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, either taken individually or through Electron, uh, which can create a Huge, powerful, apps, powerful yeah. set of tools. This is now just, just a few things now. So there's a toolkit for Electron uh, that I explored a little bit. But here are some of the things that I've been building over the last little while. This is a fully functioning RSS reader. Uh, notice 
the full website that you know on the left hand side there I've got the link that came in from the RSS reader click on the link it launches that website I don't need to worry about oh we won't we can't do it in a frame or things like that um, here's uh, jQuery in Electron used to style a simple calculator not really spectacular but it uses jQuery so all of jQuery is available to me all of React, Vue, um, Angular, all of that can be done. This is uh, a little web API that connects to an online service that checks the uh, current price of Bitcoin and in theory sends me a notification if it goes over a certain amount. Of course, like I said, notifications aren't currently working in Electron. Apparently there's a way to do it, but you have to install Microsoft Visual Studio 2015. Spent a day on notifications. Um, this is an Electron PDF bookshelf. Um, it's, it's a reader. Um, it has Cloud Sync, uh, so you can have your PDF, shared PDF library. Annotations, there's a chat. The front end uses a view framework. Lovely little tool. Um, this is Udemy. Um, Udemy is an online MOOC platform. This downloads uh, a full Udemy course, puts it on my um, on my uh, file system, and then uh, gives me access to all the videos in the course. And you can see there in the lower right hand, this is me watching one of the videos in this course. It's pretty nice. Uh, Zap is a Bitcoin Lightning wallet built from Electron. Uh, that's what I, I did that on Friday. Uh, when I say I did that on Friday, I mean I did that on Friday from beginning to end, um, making this um, wallet uh, work on my computer running from source. So now I can go in and change any of these parameters that I want, change the display, change how I connect to Bitcoin Lightning. But the thing is, this is on Bitcoin testnet. I can easily access the real Bitcoin Lightning, uh, you know, so make it a real wallet if I want. Um, and this works. And it works as a standalone application written in Electron. Um, this is me testing Zap. Uh, there's a little site out there called uh, YALS. Uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, it's, there's both a testnet version and a real version. You go to the site, uh, you click on something to read, you want to keep reading, well then you have to pay them uh, six tenths of a cent in order to finish reading the article. Um, <laughs> So I did that, except with testnet, because I'm cheap and I'm not still not willing to spend six tenths of a cent to read an article, even if it says Bernie for president. Mm -hmm. So future directions, well, the main thing I'm thinking as I've spent time on this is I wish I knew about all of this at the beginning of LPSS, because all of this is stuff that could have, should have gone into LPSS. And it would have been brilliant to have one of these electron uh, applications that gives us access to you know Bitcoin networks although I guess they didn't really exist back then but uh, PDF libraries online courses chat annotations etc RSS readers the works um, in an application that we could have developed and made available but a lot of this didn't exist at the beginning yeah, of LPSS yeah. yeah so uh, yeah, well, all of this has come on stream just in the last few years. Um, but now, just through this quick set of demonstrations that I've showed you, um, you can see where this is going. And so it's definitely been worth my time to spend the time to learn this, because now I have a tool in my hands that I can do a lot of these applications that I've been thinking about for many years. Is there a device adaptation? Can you run this on your mobile? Or? Electron doesn't run on mobile node. All of the node stuff does. Uh, so there's a, a divergent path there. Uh, you'd have to write separate um, mobile applications. Electron apps run, however, on um, 
Windows, Linux, and Macintosh. So you're, you're capturing the whole desktop. There's a Wired article out there that says, you know, the desktop belongs to Electron. That's probably true. Uh, so eventually, maybe there will be a single unifying thing, but basically right now I'd look at developing the application in Node, then packaging it with Electron, and looking at alternative packaging for mobile. I haven't explored that yet, but I will. Did you use it for your projects uh, so far? I haven't used it for anything so far. That's next, right? Um, I've spent, I, I did um, I did a course on it over the Christmas break. I've been, this is what I've learned over the last two months. Um, and now what I want to do is start implementing some projects using these frameworks and, and see what I can build. Okay. Well, uh, that's the end. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you found it worth the extra time. <laughs> that was very interesting. I mean, I learned a few things, yeah, for, for sure. And the connection to Azure also. That well, was very impressive. Yeah. I don't know how you can do that. All right, for everyone, uh, I'll just disconnect. So thank you very much for attending. Sorry for